Welcome. Those of us in this classroom bring greetings to those of you watching by DVD around the world. We're glad that you've joined us for this session in the course on spiritual gifts. This is in fact session 11 and today we're going to be talking about Paul's analogy of the human body to the body of Christ. And as we'll see, it's a wonderful uh, illustration of how the body of Christ operates. Today we'll be looking at Romans 12, and if you'll open your Bibles, Romans 12, beginning with verse 4 and going to verse 6, and just the first part of verse 6. The human body is an incredibly complex organism. I took some time to study just how complex the human body is. There are 75 organs in the human body. There are 206 bones, 640 skeletal muscles, 900 ligaments, 100,000 miles of blood vessels, and millions and millions of nerve endings. There's 500 to 600 lymph nodes, 18 to 20 square feet of skin, 32 permanent teeth, and 10 trillion blood cells. I would say that's a pretty complex organism. It constantly amazes me how people can deny that there is a God when they see the complexity of the world just in this one example of how complex the human body is. It's pretty hard to imagine that all of this just happened. Certainly there must have been a master creator, a master designer, someone far more uh, intellectual than we are to be able to put something so complex together and have it last for 70, 80, even more years. Well, let's turn to Romans 12, beginning at verse 4, and take a look at what Paul says about how the human body illustrates what happens in the body of Christ. In verse 4, Paul begins by saying, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not ha all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. In that one section, Paul talks about the human body and then relates it to the body of Christ. Now in a future session, we'll dive more in depth about this concept because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul goes much further in depth about the topic and unfolds it, unpacks it for us in far greater detail. Think about the human body. It's one unit. It's one body. And yet within, there are many members, many parts. Uh, there's the brain, there's the heart, there's the circulatory system, there's the liver, the kidney, the spleen many, many parts within the body, and yet all of them together form one unit. And each unit has a different function. What the brain does isn't what the ear does. What the eye does isn't what the feet does. Each unit has a different set of functions, and yet they all work together. They're all interrelated, and they're one unit. It's an absolutely amazing illustration of how the body of Christ works because those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are one body. We are the church. And as we've said before, many times people think of the church as the building you attend to go to service. Yes, we call it a church, but it's a church building, the actual church are the people inside. They make up the church. There is a children's uh, game that is played sometimes, and you may have seen it. You know, here's the church, here's the steeple, 
open the doors and see all the people. The people inside the church are the church. Well, the second part of how it relates is that we belong to each other according to what Paul says. We are, in fact, brothers and sisters. In some cultures, when you greet another uh, believer and you are a man, you say, yeah, welcome brother, welcome sister. And the woman says, welcome sister, welcome brother. And that does symbolize who we are. We are brothers and sisters, all part of one family who are united in Christ, who is the one body. And we are the individual members. So when we look at the human body and we say it's one unit with many members, Christ is the one unit. You and I are the many members and each of us has different functions, different gifts that we have been given to use. And in using those gifts, we make this body healthy and strong and growing instead of a body that is experiencing uh, disease, who is experiencing injury, who is experiencing pain. When people do not use their gift, the body of Christ does not function as well as when everyone does use their gift. It's almost like if you don't use your gift, somehow the body of Christ is disabled. We don't have an arm. We don't have an eye. The brain is dead which is happening to me. And as you see, we need it all to have one body that's healthy and strong. Now, what we're going to see as we continue in the study of the human body is there are some great principles that Paul continues to come back to throughout his discussion of this topic. In fact, the more I read the Apostle Paul and his epistles, the more I'm amazed at just how smart he was. He was the perfect person for God to use in the very early days to explain all of these wonderful things about the church, which, as we remember, was a mystery kept secret until God chose to reveal it in his appointed time, in his kairos. Let's take a look at what those principles are. If we think of this whole uh, blackboard as the body of Christ, all right, the entire blackboard, there is one overarching principle that Paul says. There is unity in the body. We are one body. And that encompasses the whole rest of the principles. Every principle comes back to unity. You know, Jesus continued to say, you are one in the Spirit. You are one. You know, love one another because you are one. But then within that unity, there are four principles that all help to tie in together how we remain united and how, in fact, we could be divided unless we work hard at it. So, Let's divide this into four quadrants and say, within unity, there are four principles. And one of them is, there is diversity. In my church, at one time, it was almost all composed of white people who were middle or upper class and lived in very nice suburban homes. But over the past few years, an incredible transformation has taken place as in my country of America, this same incredible diversity has occurred. We now have many Latinos who come to our church. And they, in fact, because many of them only speak Spanish, we have a church service for them. And then many of those, as they become more proficient in English, come to the English-speaking service because they want to learn how to speak English. And there's no better way than to hear English being taught. We have many black people because 
in our country where one t at one time blacks were slaves, when they were freed, they became the ones who worked at the lower class jobs. But as they've gained more and more education over time, they've begun to move into a middle class and even an upper class and owners of businesses. They live in the same communities that I live in, in my condo. Uh, there's a friend of mine named Andrew and he is black. He owned a business and now he's able to live in a very nice suburban community. So we see great diversity in terms of the ethnicity of people, in terms of the wealth of people, but also in terms of their abilities, in terms of their giftedness, and in terms of the various needs that they have in life. And so Jesus created this body of Christ for us to be able to help one another despite our diversity. Diversity is a wonderful principle. It enriches life. It brings different perspectives. However, it also can be a great cause of dissension and conflict. And many churches have broken apart because of this diversity. You may not have experienced this in your culture, but I have a feeling you may have. There's been a transition going on in church music. At one time we sang the traditional hymns, holy, 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 great is thy faithfulness. And I love those hymns. And they were played on the organ and people sang them from a hymnal. But as time goes on, has gone on, there has been the emergence of the contemporary Christian music scene. People like Michael W. Smith, Chris Tomlin, who have written these wonderful worship songs that use guitars and use drums and synthesizers. And often this creates problems between older people and younger people. The older people want the old hymns, the ones I remember from my childhood. And of course, those who are younger say, let's listen to the contemporary. And so some churches have tried to say, well, let's have a church service at 9 o'clock that's going to sing the old hymns. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll sing the contemporary. And then the people at 9 o'clock who are going to sing the old hymns, they go, but I go at 11 o'clock. That's when I go. I want to go at 11 o'clock. I don't want to go to 9 o'clock. And of course, the people at 11 o'clock They're happy because younger people tend to sleep in in the morning. But they don't want to hear the older hymns. So now you have a breakup of the body. And many churches have broken apart, completely separated over this one issue. So diversity can cause major problems in the body of Christ. Diversity is one of these issues that's under the banner of uh, unity in the body. But there's also a second example, and this is the interrelatedness of the body. Now let me explain what I mean. Interrelated means we're connected. We all are a part of each other. This is the concept that says each person has to do their part. The brain has to do its function. The heart can't say, I'm not going to do mine. It has to do its function. The hands have to feel. Everybody has to do its part. And because of that, we are interrelated. We are connected. And as I've said before, when someone does not do their part, then the body of Christ suffers. It's not as efficient. It's like suddenly it's got a cold because the nose isn't doing its part. And then, of course, it goes from the nose to the ears. And then the ears aren't hearing as well, and it's not doing its part. And then that travels down into the throat area, and sometimes even to the chest. And pretty soon, the body is not functioning as well because some part of the body isn't doing their part. So that's interrelatedness. The third concept that Paul brings out 
and we'll discuss, is the concept of equality. And we have talked about this before. There is no gift that is more important than any other gift. Yet, some people would say certain gifts are more important than others. This typically are the gifts that we call the upfront gifts. The gifts where someone like myself stands before the church and you can see me do my, uh, use my gift as opposed to someone else who works in an office as a layperson and helps develop a plan for how to create some program. And nobody sees that person working and yet they can feel like I'm not as important. I mean, gee, the pastor's up there preaching and teaching and serving. Certainly the pastor is more important than I am. In the body of Christ, the pastor is equal with the layperson. Pastor is not above. The pastor is co-equal with us. But God has given the pastor a unique role to fulfill of serving the entire body and being very visible to the body and being an essential part of the body. However, no more important than other members of the body. So equality is a principle we'll come back to examine in uh, for future sessions. The final principle, and again, under this overarching principle of unity, is uniqueness. It's the idea that despite the fact that we're equal, we all are different. Do you know that there is no one like you? There is no one who has ever lived like you, who has ever lived who is exactly like you are. Nobody today in all of the world, the five billion people, who's like you. And when you die, and other people come, there'll be nobody like you in the future. You are one of a kind. Uh, sometimes in my country we say we broke the mold. Jesus said, okay, I'll make this one. Ah, oh, it's a masterpiece. All right, let's break the mold. Now let's make a new masterpiece. All right, let's break the mold. Here's another one, which shows us how infinitely creative uh, God is in designing and creating and equipping his people. So we'll come back and we'll look at uniqueness. Each of these has to have uh, work together. If any one of them does not, we will break up the unity of the church. And in a sense, it would be like the magician who cuts the body in half. Now, the magician doesn't really cut the body in half. But let's suppose he did. It's like a church breaks into two. And there's no sadder thing in the body of Christ than when a church divides and becomes two churches. We do not present a great witness to the world. Many feelings are hurt and certainly there's no unity in the body. Each of these four principles helps to create unity but the other side of the sword is that it can create conflict and disunity and eventually the breaking apart of a church. You know, there's one thing to look at scripture and be able to go in and pull out principles and say, boy, I see how God has helped to create the body of Christ. And that's the job of a teacher. God has equipped a teacher to go into the Bible, look at just two verses, or actually three and a half, and say, here are those principles. All right, and you may look at that and say, I could never go into the Bible and look at those verses and go, huh, I see all of these things that have just been mentioned. Why am I able to do it? And perhaps you are not? Because that's how God equipped me. And so I'm serving you, but you in fact may be 
a person who gives encouragement or who shows mercy or who gives help. And this is a very good thing. It's just you don't necessarily stand up in front of a classroom, in front of a camera, where a DVD is going to be made and distributed around the world. We each have our different role. But one thing we have in common, despite the fact you may not be able to go into scripture and pull out principles the way I have, you are able to teach yourself. In one part of scripture, Paul says, you are growing as Christians. Before you had milk, now you need to have meat. You need solid food. You need deeper truths. And yes, you get that from the pastor and from teachers, but how much better when you get it from yourself going into scripture. And there is one spiritual practice that is probably the most neglected spiritual practice of all. Many of us do Bible study. Many of us pray. Many of us evangelize. These are all spiritual practices. Some of us journal. Some of us take part in small groups. Spiritual practices, ways that we help each other grow and we help ourselves grow. But the one very few people do anymore and the one that God promises a blessing is meditation. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. And so, as I was preparing for this lesson, I started to meditate on these principles. And I looked at, hmm, how is the human body the same as the body of Christ? even more than what Paul has gone into. And so I began to draw out principles. Now if you would, we're not going to come back to Romans 12, so you can turn in uh, the Old Testament to Joshua. And turn to Joshua chapter 1 and in verse 8. And there's a wonderful uh, truth here about memorization. And that truth goes this way. Joshua writes, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will make your way prosperous and successful. It is the only spiritual practice where God promises you that there will be prosperity and success. And yet few of us do it. And why? Because few of us know how to. And because it takes work. And most of us don't like to work as hard as you have to work for meditation. When you hear the word meditation, you may think of, you know, the Eastern mystic, the yogi who lives up on the hill and people come to him, oh master, tell me the secret of the world, you know. Or we think of, um, um, that is not Christian meditation. In fact, in, in Eastern meditation, the whole idea is to empty your mind of thoughts. This is very dangerous because when you empty your mind of all thoughts, guess who has an opportunity to plant thoughts in your mind? The evil one. And so Eastern meditation is not what we're talking about and is in fact dangerous. So what is Christian meditation? It is simply taking a verse and like a cow chews on their cud, they take some grass and the cow chews it over and over again, breaking it down. In fact, cows have eight stomachs. 
I only have one. I don't know about you, but they have eight. And it's so that over those eight stomachs, they continue to break it down finer and finer and finer. And that's what we do in Christian meditation. For example, and I will just give you this example. In chewing it over, there are three things you can do. You can emphasize certain words to draw out deeper meanings, to break it down, to chew it a little more. Or you can ask questions about it. Or you can pray about it. So let me take Joshua 1.8 and just demonstrate for you how, in fact, would you meditate? Well, I look at the verse and I'm going to use emphasis first to give you the idea that you can pull out different ideas. Do not let the book of this law. Hmm. Do not. All right. Now you kind of talk about it to yourself. That's chewing on it. All right. I am not supposed to stop reading the Word of God, thinking about the Word of God. All right, do not, do not let this book of the law, huh, I'm to be reading the Bible more and more. The Bible is what I should put in my mind. Okay, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Well, I don't think he means that I should be talking about it all the time, but that I should never be in a place where I couldn't talk about it all the time. Okay, I get it. And you would continue on with the other phrases. It's like having a self-dialogue. You know, we all have thoughts running in our brain all the time. We're having a dialogue with ourself. This is a structured dialogue about a verse. And you're chewing it, and you're breaking it down, and you're seeing it from this perspective, and that perspective, and that perspective so that you get more out of it. The second way is to ask questions, all right? And that might be, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Huh, I wonder what, what God means about meditating on it day and night. I mean, how could I do this all the time? Why? Sometimes you may have an answer. Sometimes you might have to ask. In this one, I would say, I don't think he mean, means that every moment of every single day I should do nothing but meditate, like over in a corner. I just think he means I should always have the awareness of God's presence and the truths of Scripture in my mind. Because what you put into your mind, as we have talked about, affects your behavior. Those of you who are knowledgeable about the computers know that there's a little phrase, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in your mind, guess what's going to come out? Garbage. But if you put the Word of God in your mind, then you will begin to act in accordance with the Bible. The final way that you can meditate is a prayer. All right, And that might be this way. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Lord, and I want to thank you for the Bible. I want to thank you for the truth the Bible has. It has helped me so much in days gone by. It's given me comfort. It's brought joy to my life. It's given me direction for where I should go. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the Bible. And then you would go on and read the next part until inside you feel kind of a, nudge, a prompting about a phrase, and then you stop, and then you pray, and you're having a dialogue with God, where before I talked about having a dialogue within yourself, this time you and God are talking to each other. So I would encourage you as you read, don't just read. Don't just expect the pastor to tell you what the Bible says. You can learn it yourself. Well, in today's session, primarily we have learned how the human body is very similar to the body of Christ. We have seen this diagram of overarching principles of unity, and within that unity, the principles of diversity, interrelatedness, equality, and uniqueness. And we will examine those in first future sessions 
and we hope you'll join us then.